Hello everyone, welcome back to Debating with America's Youth. Today we're going to be looking at the NSDA final round for the 2020 Public Forum a final debate round. Uh, today we're going to be breaking it down with one of the competitors. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, my name is David Ike. I go to Campbell Hall and I was the second speaker of the uh, negation in this round at NSDA finals for Public Forum. And then, so this week we'll be doing it with uh, David, and then next week we'll be doing it with the uh, two national champions. We're going to be breaking down the speech as well. So definitely stay tuned for that. All right, let's uh, get the video started. In this moment, we reevaluate how we re how we view the structures of our society, and we negate. Resolved, unbalanced charter schools are beneficial to the quality of education in the U.S. Observation one, we define two factors that optimize quality education. The first is quality teachers. The ASTD reports that the most important factor in student learning is the teacher and concludes that improving teachers would improve outcomes more than any other single factor. The second is lived experiences. Run 15 reports that emotional health is the greatest predictor of life satisfaction as an adult, while academic success is the least important. Our sole contention concerns... Yeah, so... um. I'll just interject in there really quick. So that sort of observation, I've never really done on any kind of topic except for this one. And I think the reason that I did that here, sort of defining what like quality education was is because the topic was very sort of vague, really. It just said like on balance, charter schools are beneficial for education, right? And obviously there's going to be a ton of impacts like all across the topic ranging from things like teachers to SAT scores, et cetera, et cetera. So we thought if we can really set up very early in the debate round, like with evidence and all of that, why we think that these two things, quality teachers and the lived experiences of those students are the most important, then we're always going to be ahead on the weighing debate, like comparing our arguments, because we've already like set that up. So anything they're doing now, they're going to be having to do with the rebuttal speeches, whereas now it's already in the judge's mind, the framework that we've established making a market out of education. Smith-19 explains that neoliberalism, not to be confused with modern-day liberals or Democrats, is an ideology that affirms the value of free market competition. Metcalf-17 furthers that neoliberalism views the free market economy as the model for all human activity. In terms of education, Moral 11 explains that charter schools are a function of neoliberalism insofar as they compete with traditional schools for both students and tax funding. Subpoint A is the marketization of education space. Blakely 17 writes that in the private sector, competition creates winners and losers, but in the public sphere, the effects of a school losing are catastrophic. Berkeley 19 writes that neoliberals have spent millions of dollars per year funding think tanks that have exercised control over legislation to prioritize charter over public schools. This includes tax credits for funding charter schools and distributing immigration visas in exchange for foreign investment into charters. They conclude that the federal government is deliberately undermining the public school system by using private money and public funds to build charter schools instead of investing in a more robust public school system. There are two impacts. The first is teachers. The EPI 19 finds that the current funding crisis crisis has led to schools not having the funds to staff vacancies, leading to a massive teacher shortage crisis in public schools. Will 20 finds that losing 10% of school budgets would cause 173,000 teaching jobs to be lost. The second impact is education deserts. Martin 19 finds that the effects of siphoning away funding from public schools can be irreversible as districts often recoup less than 20% of lost funding each year. As a result, Blakely 17 writes that in places like Detroit, due to the widespread defunding and closing of schools, there are now educational deserts where students have to travel for hours just to attend school. Additionally, Larson 14 finds that students experiencing school closure are 10% more likely to drop out. This issue disproportionately impacts low-income students, as Blakely 17 reports that the wealthy can simply move their children to other schools. Neoliberal market competition in education creates a vicious cycle in which low-income communities are further punished for their poverty. Subpoint B is the... So yeah, we can um, sort of analyze that uh, subpoint really quick. I think the main thing just in general for this case is that whenever you're at a tournament like nationals, you probably want your case uh, to have much less words than our case did. Because Liana, you can see, is having to read fairly quickly, which wasn't really a problem in some of the other rounds, but in this one where uh, obviously the judges are qualified as it's NSDA finals, but they're not sort of like the circuit tech judges that you would see across like tournaments like, you know, Harvard or Berkeley and so on. Uh, so you want to sort of slow down your case, try to keep it around like 715 words in public forum. I think this one was closer to like 780 or something. 
So that's the first thing in general. But then on the first sub point, this was sort of our, um, you know, like, I guess you would refer to it as like a time suck. Like we would go for it in some rounds, but this one, we had it link into that first impact of our observation about quality teachers. So that was our first impact about teachers. The second one was about educational deserts. And that sort of uh, established Wayne early on that we knew we would use if we went for this, which was a prerequisite, right? Which is that um, essentially, if there are no schools in the area, then any other aspect of quality education no longer matters because those students are no longer in those schools to begin with. So I think the main thing that you want to do when you're structuring your case is have the weighing that you're going to be going for in mind beforehand and then also be embedding that weighing into the case. Um, I think actually this case wasn't that good at that. this, as we'll see in like a little bit later. Like there's not a lot of specific impacts. This one's um, talking only about Detroit. The other one's talking about a teacher shortage, but doesn't exactly quantify, you know, like what that actually does or like how many students would actually lose access to teachers. So I think whenever you're looking for an impact, there's two things you should have in mind. The first one is how many people are impacted generally that's like a good thing to do just to set up Wayne and then the second second is in what way they are impacted like how severe that impact is and I think if you do those two things then it makes the Wayne very clear but yeah generally you want to have your Wayne embedded in the case and you want to know what types of Wayne you're going to be doing basically every single round modification of outcomes. Sunbaum 18 reports that charter schools must achieve strict academic outcomes in order to stay open and attract students. This is because, as Real 16 explains, neoliberal reformists increase the emphasis on standardized testing as a metric to evaluate the quality of charter schools as compared to public schools. As a result, Simon 13 writes that charter and public schools are locked in a market competition with outcomes hinging on test results, in other words, proliferating the system's emphasis on them. There are two impacts. The first is teachers. All E19 reports that because of the neoliberal liberal models reliance on testing, a teacher's effectiveness and often pay is measured by test results. This pressures teachers to use highly scripted curriculums leading to an exodus from the profession. The second impact is degraded critical thinking. Saltman 10 reports that value is now defined by test scores. Because there is finite study time, there is no place for learning that doesn't raise scores, and he concludes that the ethical, social, historical, and political aspects of our lives are no longer relevant to education. As a result, Watkins 12 explains that the education system ignores the social context in which students learn, in effect erasing their identities. Crucially, Saltman 09 explains that such critical knowledge is necessary if students are to engage as public citizens in the forming and sustaining of communities. Mulder 18 concludes that existing inequalities are thus reinforced within the system. It fosters an acceptance of the capitalist status quo and the hierarchical structures within it, reinforcing the structural inequality it was designed to combat. Jarreau 11 writes that no democratic society can survive without educational practices which produce citizens who are critical, self-reflective, willing to make moral judgments, and act in a socially responsible fashion, for which reason we are proud to negate. Yeah, and then so on that second subpoint, like I was just talking about, I think the thing that we probably could have done better is again contextualizing our impacts because really our like terminal impact in this entire case comes from the Jarreau evidence, which is that no democratic society can survive without these critical aspects of education that are currently being slacked upon. I think though, especially at a tournament like I was just talking about, like nationals, um, what we sort of lacked in very contextualized specific impacts, we made up for with a pretty good narrative, which I think probably would have come out a lot better if we went a little bit slower in this round. So every single facet of our case all engages with this idea of neoliberalism and competition, right? So like, I see a lot of people on the circuit will do like three contention cases. And I think there is strategic value for that. But at a tournament like this, I think it's always good to have a very cohesive narrative where you're sort of telling a story, um, as a lot of people would say, right? So you want to be explaining your arguments in a way that makes sense to the judges, not just in the way that's going to like, give you the most amount of content in your speech. So I think we did that good. But so yeah, and then again, our impacts on this link into our stuff about first quality teachers on our first impact, which is very vague when we didn't really go for it, but like we had the observation there in case we wanted to. And the second one is critical thinking, which sort of links into this idea of the lived experiences of students. How, how would you recommend that like people who are writing their cases uh, get good information in there without going too fast? Like how do you decide what you want to put in there? I know you talked about the narrative. Are there any other like tips you want to share? Um, well, I would say, like, 
generally you want to be researching a solid amount before you even start writing your case, right? So you want to really engage with the literature on the topic and see what the most common arguments are and what like, yeah, exactly, just what has the most literature behind it, right? So in this, uh, in this round or with this case specifically, we didn't go for the most common argument, but we sort of controlled our own niche, right? Which was this idea of neoliberalism, which if you just do like a very quick Google search, not a lot of stuff comes up about like neoliberalism in charter schools. But if you go to things like Google Scholar, there's just a ton of studies that sort of do all of the work I need to do in my case for me, right? So I think to formulate a narrative, you basically, you just want to make your arguments as true as possible, right? So the more truth that your argument has to it, the easier it's going to be for the judges to understand. And secondly, the harder it's going to be for your opponents to respond to it. So I think that like a narrative can sort of be crafted just by trying to find the truest argument on the topic and then, um, you know, really controlling it. So, yeah. So, and again, you don't just want to conflate like very common arguments with the most true. And that's why you want to be doing all of that research. And I think the best strategy on any topic is sort of controlling your own niche of the topic of the resolution. Maggie and I affirm the resolution. On balance, charter schools are beneficial to the quality of education in the United States. Our sole contention is reforming the education system. In the early 1990s, America's public education system was failing. To combat this, President Clinton, Bush, and Obama championed the school reform movement, which saw charter schools as an important tool. Future Ed 18 quantifies that since then, the number of charter students has increased by 2.4 million, and the movement has succeeded. According to Lee of Boston College 18, public high school graduation rates in the United States have increased over the past 15 years and now stand at an all-time high of 83 percent. Charter schools have been responsible for this movement and the overall quality of education for two reasons. The first reason, one is for allowing by specialization. Charter schools foster a more innovative approach to teaching. Butcher of Real Clear Policy 13 reports that instead of having to abide lockstep with standardized curricula, charter schools choose their own curriculum to meet the individual needs of their students, allowing for more specialization and innovation within the classroom. This helps at-risk populations in particular. Swapwatch of the Heritage Foundation 19 finds that innovative curricula give public charter schools the opportunity to implement specific communities and tailor their programs to them, for example, low-income communities. In a 2015 study that examined over 1 million charter school records, the Center for Research on Education Outcomes 15 compared charters to similarly situated district schools and established that charters create substantial gains for students in poverty. In low-income areas, charters students at charters saw gains equivalent to 43 additional days of learning per year. Across the board, a more personalized approach to learning benefits educational quality. Booker of Mathematica 14 found that high school graduation rates are up 11% higher at charter schools than at similar district schools. But the second way is by reforming district schools. So I'll just pause there. I'm sure that um, they're going to have a lot more to say about their case because obviously I wasn't, you know, at all involved in like the process but again you sort of see in this case as well that there's a pretty strong narrative so the first thing that they say after reading their tagline is giving this historical context about how early how about like in the early 90s the education system was failing and to reform that we introduced charter schools as a result we've seen all of these gains in like academic achievement a 15 percent increase in graduation rates stuff like that so that sort of like historical context can be really good and just sort of contextualizing your argument and whatnot. Um, yeah. Unlike regular district schools, charters are founded on the belief that all students, not just affluent ones who can afford private schools, should be able to choose where they receive an education. In districts without charters, Forster of the Friedman Foundation 18 concludes that the monopoly system of public education ensures that no meaning accountability for performance can occur. Providing school choice holds school administrators accountable, especially since public schools receive funding on a per student basis, incentivizing them to retain as many students as possible. To remain viable, district schools invest the same focused, innovative teaching as charters. Holly of Education Next 13 explains this phenomenon, stating that district schools implement reforms that use resources more effectively, improve the overall quality of education within the traditional public school, and increase responsiveness to student needs. This is relatively easy to do, as DeAngelis of the Cato Institute 20 writes that monopoly power in the traditional public school system leads to bloat in administration and a wasteful use of funds. 
He concludes, however, that competitive pressures create strong incentives to spend money on direct classroom expenditures. The numbers check out. In a 14-year analysis of nearly 600 charter schools, Cords of Temple University 17 finds that charter schools triggered an average increase in instructional spending by 7%, with Jackson of UC Berkeley 16 finding could lead to an additional 0.46 years of completed education. In addition to spending more on student instruction, district schools often begin to collaborate with nearby charters. Holly explains that in a study of 12 districts, eight out of the 12 locations, cooperations led to the replication of successful charter school practices within district schools. It is for these reasons that Cords explains the introduction of a charter school within one mile of a district school decreases the rate at which students are held back a grade by 40%. This is one of the best indicators of educational quality since it means that struggling students begin to receive better instruction, which gave them a chance at successful educations in life. Indeed, Hughes of Texas A&M University 17 found that held, be, being held back increases the likelihood of a student dropping out of high school by three times. Overall, because charters fill in the cracks of the failing public education system, Maggie and I are proud to affirm. Yeah, so a really good case. Um, they also had sort of like embedded Wayne in there, right? That I that they used later in the round. So they read that stuff about how like uh, you know students being held back decreased by forty percent in schools nearby. And then they said, like, that's vital for struggling students, et cetera, et cetera. So they sort of have that embedded weight in there, and they're going to talk about, like, why that should be the most important impact in the round. The only difference is that we put that in our case, which I think probably put us, like, a step ahead on that debate, because the judges have a very clear outline of what they're looking for, versus sort of having to, like, spot this embedded weight. But again, I would really only recommend that for, like, very broad topics like this, where there's no clear definition of, like, what educational outcomes actually mean. Um, I'll let them probably go into like deeper detail about like how they made their case, what they think the benefits and downfalls of it were. So you guys should all t uh, tune in next week. But I do think the one uh, very interesting thing about our two cases is that the links interact very well, right? So uh, the entirety of our case is talking about how the marketization of education and this competition between charter schools and public schools has sort of collapsed the education system by making it oriented towards standardized tests. tests. And they, on the other hand, say that, no, this competition is really good on their stuff about reforming district schools because in order for, for those public schools to keep up, they have to make innovative new practices, right? So we both pretty much have the same exact link, which is that there is competition between those two schools. The only thing that differs is the impact of that competition which means that the person who wins this round is probably going to, is going to be the person who just explains why their link is functionally more true than our link. And hopefully that's what CROSS should be about. I don't really remember what it's about, but let me see. Let's say I were to be charitable and grant you a lot of the advantages of charter schools. What happens to the 50 million students in the public school system whose schools don't have the market ability to compete with charter schools? When sure. So here's what Maggie and I tell you from our case. We tell you that even though you say competition is good, in this round, we're going to argue that the competition that district schools provides public schools is actually a good thing. And that's really important because before the introduction of charter schools into the market, as you would claim, we didn't really see public schools reforming themselves or cutting back their waste or doing everything that we tell you in the case. That's where uniquely we benefit those students, those 51 million students that you talk about, because for the first time we're offering a chance of change. But I'm going to ask you a question on your case, if that's okay. Can I clarify something first? Of course, go ahead. Which is that in your case, you basically say competition is the incentive for reform. And yeah. then at the bottom of the case, you say it's great innovation because they're collaborating. So are they collaborating or are they competitive entities? So there's a difference here, right? Charter schools and public schools or district schools, we would say, have the vested interest of making themselves better. When one improves their improving quality of education, the other sees that and wants to improve the quality of education for the other students in the other given school, vice versa. I'm going to ask you a question. No, we would say they, you can collaborate and still compete. You can still share ideas. And I'm just going to ask you a question on your case. We've spent a lot of time on this. So I think that was a pretty good question from Liana. Um, in a lot of rounds, I think most debaters know this, that like the questions you ask aren't always necessarily in the spirit of like finding the actual truth, right? It's um, it's more just to sort of like uh, implant ideas into the judge's mind, right? So her first question was like, how do you solve back for the 50 million students who aren't in charter schools? Obviously they have their answer, but then that sort of leads to this trap, I guess, this like logical trap that Liana lays, which is are they collaborating or are they competing? 
And so I think that's a good question, not so much because it's unanswerable. Obviously, there are answers to it, which uh, Sasha answered pretty well, but it's more just like casting the shadow of doubt in the judge's mind on their lane. Because at this point in the debate, we both already know again that it's just going to be who proves their link is more probable and more true. So the thesis of your case towards the bottom is that we're implementing measures like standardized testing that inhibit students from learning creatively, right? Well, let me clarify. You tell us that in the 1990s, education was failing. We contend that before the 1990s and the introduction of charter schools, schools were more, foc more focused on critical thinking skills, but whenever sure. there were competitive entities in the market, awesome. neoliberals knew there needed to be an objective metric of evaluation so, to compare the value of the goods. Really quickly, I'm going to ask my question now. So if that's the case, and if standardized testing is what is inhibiting critical thinking from happening, what has been the general trend of standardized testing since 2015? Schools focused almost exclusively on it to the no. exclusion of more important skills. So according to the Washington Post, the amount of standardized tests that have been given both through charters and district schools has been cut in half since 2015. So if market structures are the reason as to why standardized testing is happening, then why are we seeing standardized testing decrease? I mean, we're going to contest that that is, in fact, the trend. But if you think about it on a logical basis, because we're going to have competing evidence, it makes sense, right? Because if the outcome is always evaluated by the effects of standardized tests, why wouldn't teachers t teach the sure. test? Why wouldn't but, students be learning that? Because it's the only way they've been taught right. to be successful in the new um, But on the flip side... Um, I think that's always a good strategy, what Liana just did, which is that when you have two competing pieces of evidence, then you want to sort of turn it into this um, logic debate, right? And so in this particular scenario, their evidence was probably better than ours because um, it just sounded like more recent, whereas ours was like this very vague sort of like charter schools have increased standardized tests through this competition, whereas theirs was like since 2015, we've seen standardized tests be cut in half. So their evidence was probably more specific. So if you know that in terms of the evidence debate, you're going to be fighting this uphill battle, then you sort of want to revert back to the actual logical warranting of your case and the sort of narrative that you've been telling the judges, right? And that's why I think that narrative debate and having just like a very clear cut case with arguments that all follow the same line of logic is really important. Because even in this case where their evidence is probably better, if the judges understand our argument from a logical perspective better, then they're going to be more likely to refer us when we say, well, let's just look at the logic because we have competing evidence without actually going into the specificity of those pieces of evidence. I think if you're sugar in here, you should probably say, no, we don't have competing evidence. We shouldn't look to the logic. Yours evidence is from like 2011 and doesn't quantify anything. We tell you that the trend is clearly going to the other direction. So it sort of depends which side of the debate you're on. Side of that, if the competition is good, like I say it is, and we're seeing schools try to improve themselves, and charter schools, for example, acknowledge that standardized testing really isn't that great, and we're seeing the trend of standardized testing, which is the link into your case, go away, then obviously the competition isn't really that bad. Well, we're going to contest that standardized testing trends are going down, but the more important thing is that competition on your side of the debate is what leads to the closure of 234 public schools in Detroit because they right. simply didn't have the funds to compete. But so, I believe at the end of cross examination. I'll just uh, briefly talk about what was going in my head right now. I was in like a full on panic, pretty much. Um, <laughs> So like not so much because I didn't know how to respond to their case, but just sort of, you know, the idea that like I was in nationals and everything. So I think uh, what I've learned since then is that you just want to try to remain calm. You it like it's just sort of in your bound because you'll see what I sort of do is that because I'm sort of nervous, I instead of thinking about the arguments logically and just thinking about like the logical flaws of their case, and analytical responses that I could give to their case or cross applications of my case that sort of do the link lane for the judge, I sort of just plunge into my block files, right? I sort of just go into the research that I've done and I sort of, you know, I just copy and paste onto a speech doc during this prep time. And then as a result, my rebuttal was fine and I had a few of those analytical responses, but if I had taken the time to, you know, just take a deep breath and think about their case logically, my rebuttal probably would have been a lot better. So you'll see here, 
there's a mixture of analytics and those carded responses from like my block file. But I think it's, I, I'm also, I don't remember like totally, but I think it's overwhelmingly those blocks. And part of that is because I was sort of anxious to the point where like, it was one harder to think and then two like harder to write stuff down even like just very nervous. So try to remain calm, try to like rationalize where you are before the round. Also, I think I was on like two hours of sleep at this point because in California, you had to wake up at like 4 a.m. pretty much if you wanted to go to the round uh, because it was all sort of weighted towards like uh, Eastern time. So yeah, it was, it was sort of a, a combination that made me nervous. So, you know, I guess just think about the arguments logically before you go into your block files, I guess what I would say. And that's the mistake I made during this prep time. Really quickly, um, would you say that because you were nervous, maybe you cut down on the narrative that you were trying to like have throughout your case? Yes, exactly. I think that's sort of, I think that probably the reason that we lost this round is for exactly that reason, which is that throughout the round, the narrative that we were really good at portraying in all of our other rounds, we sort of lost in this round. And I think part of that might be one, like honestly, because we were sleep deprived, but two is because we had, and mainly is because we had gotten so used to explaining this narrative to judges and we had gotten so used to understanding it ourselves that in the actual round, we sort of slacked on that. We sort of assumed that the judges would be able to fill in the logical holes that we already knew the answers to because we had done all the research, we had written it all up and we had explained it so many times. But you have to stay consistent in every single round when you're running a case like this and make Make sure that every single uh, specific step of logic and every single piece of the argument is all there. It's going to be starting off with two observations um, that you can flow either at the top of their case or the bottom, wherever you have room. If you don't have room anywhere, then maybe use a separate sheet of paper, but it shouldn't be too long. And then it will just be going down their case. Is everybody ready? Okay, let's start the time now. Start off with an observation. All of their evidence must be discredited. Don't be fooled by the official sounding names of the statistics they read because one, they stem from charter lobbying groups. Lecker 19 reports that the effort to push charter schools is by wealthy out of state individuals with no connection to the education system. Mulder 18 reports that this lobbying was done in opposition to actual educators and students. And indeed, Roy 15 writes that charter schools were the biggest special interest group in state politics, outspending teacher unions two to one. But secondly, is that Riska 16 writes that charter schools use selection bias. Because they're less regulated, they can require students who apply for law to fill out immense applications attracting engaged parents and already high achieving students. They conclude that students who enter charter schools were already higher achieving than their peers. That means obviously some studies will be skewed towards charter schools, but that does not mean that they're better educators. Thirdly, it's because RISCA 16 reports that charter schools disproportionately suspend black students and students with special needs, ranging from those with disabilities to English language learners as a way to disincentivize students who are underperforming to continue attending, artificially raising their test scores. For that reason, the Institute of Education Sciences writes in their meta analysis of analyzing numerous studies with only strong methodological designs that charter schools do not have a significant impact on student achievement. At that point, the only thing they do is siphon away funds and orient thinking into a mode of exclusively standardized testing. But then the second observation is that charter schools reify structures of oppression by simply making students cogs in the machine for neoliberals. This was probably a good strategy in this round um, in terms of like in terms of strategy, that was repetitive. But I think because our links are so similar in this case, that these three warrants cast a pretty sizable shadow of doubt on the entire narrative of their case, because a lot of their evidence was dealing with very like sort of quantitative measurements of education, right? So things like uh, being held back because of bad grades, things like test scores, et cetera. So if we can say that like for these three reasons, all of those things are probably skewed and then cross apply the narrative of our case and say at that point, all they do is siphon away funding and you know increase this reliance on standardized tests. I thought that was pretty good. The one thing that I would say is that spending probably, I don't, I'm not timing, but I'm assuming that these two observations are probably gonna take me close to like a minute and a half is probably not very time efficient, right? Because you really want to be getting down into the logic of their case and virtually in any single rebuttal, you want to be going almost card by card of their case and probably if it's first rebuttal, being like, 20 responses on their case. 
And that puts a lot of pressure in second rebuttal to both respond to those refutations and to answer your case, right? So I think doing this observation was good in terms of this round particularly because we had such similar links, but I probably should have condensed it a lot beforehand. And also we're not even on like the second observation yet, so. Which is why Connor 16 writes that the neoliberalization of public education has resulted in resources being distributed upwards to the elites who don't need them. This turns their contentions about innovation in district schools because all of these innovations and competitions are necessarily geared towards increasing test scores to maximize like these market value rather than critiquing structural inequalities. That's why all of their impact cards are talking about extra days of learning, which are evaluated through tests. This is why it's going to be actively harmful as the JRF writes that because there are so many variables that affect educational outcomes, like parental relations or access to resources, the actual quality quality of the school is only 14% in determining outcomes. At that point, we would say the only risk that you actually solve these education gaps is if you produce students who can actually solve back for all of the other things that decrease education gaps. But let's go on to their first contention about specialization and innovation. One, the NPE explains that charter school administrators work to just replicate other charters' education models to increase their chance of success, and that in the status quo, 87% of charter schools are no longer doing these specialization tactics. But secondly, you can turn it against them, as Mulder 18 reports that when charters and public education systems compete for tax dollars and students, it actually disincentivizes innovation because if you were to share those positive changes, that would mean that other that like you lose prospective students. And at that point, he concludes that overall innovation and the specialization is slowing down. But thirdly, Perspective 15 finds that when you isolate specifically for these different curriculum approaches that charter schools do, rather than just reading these broad statistics as they do, you see that the specific innovations have actually decreased educational outcomes. Our evidence is a lot more specific, so you have to prefer it. Go on to their second warrant about district schools. One yeah, so I thought those three responses all had like strategical and logical merit to them um the first one wasn't that good it was just like 80 like uh charter schools just copy each other's techniques and 87 percent aren't innovating right now but the second one i thought it was good because it reifies our narrative about disincentivizing innovation because of competition like if you're in this market competition that they themselves concede then obviously you're not going to be sharing your innovations abroad because that means that now your competitors have the edge over you um which was sort of like our narrative right and then the third one was just that when you isolate specifically for those innovations that quality goes down but what i was talking about before is that because all of these responses were just made to the tagline of their case instead of being targeted specifically to every single piece of evidence it allowed them later in the round to sort of just breeze past them right right so like for example instead of just saying like when you isolate specifically for innovation uh, educational outcomes go down, they can just say like, no, our evidence says the opposite, that outcomes go up. But if I said like, specifically on their piece of evidence, I forgot the name, where they say that we see an additional 43 days of learning, this is not because of the innovation that they talk about. This is because the first observation that we read tells you like A, B, and C reason. But when you isolate for the innovation, you see that quality goes down. So if you target those responses card by card, then they can no longer just extend those cards, right? Just like, because like, like essentially in this debate, we sort of just go in the back and forth, back and forth of like repeating each other's evidence pretty much. But when you target it and say, on this piece of evidence, it's bad for X reason, that makes it a lot harder for them to just extend that evidence across as a refutation to yours. They say that monopolies means that there's no innovation, but they never read evidence that public schools had bad educational outcomes prior to this, only that they were bloated. But we would say the Saltman evidence we read you tells you that because of the standardized testing, there's been a trade-off from the social, political, and ethical aspects of our lives. It doesn't matter if public schools are bloated if they were in the past producing citizens that could critique the status quo, which is needed to actually solve back for the vast majority of the education crisis. But secondly, their evidence doesn't take into account things like the coronavirus and the resulting recession. As Baruch 20 explains that because state revenue has decreased, like public schools have already had to make tons of budget cuts, which is why our first contention about closures is always going to be the more likely argument because in the status quo, they can't afford to just make these innovations. But thirdly, while it may be true that some public schools can afford to compete with charters, specifically ones in high income areas that have lots of funding to begin with, our Blakely evidence finds that in poor areas, public schools don't have the funds and resources to compete with charters, which is why they, uh, which is like why they uh, shut down. But lastly, they say that they take away from like these bloated administrations to increase educational days and whatnot, but the places that they're usually cutting from to decrease their bloated administration is things like janitorial services and guidance counselors. And that's really detrimental because the run evidence we read you on case tells you that emotional health by creating motivation is the biggest predictor in both academic achievement and lifetime outcomes, which means that if they cut away from like janitorial services, guidance counselors, etc., they have an on net decrease in like the academic achievements in students. Because we believe students are more than a cog in the machine, we are very happy to negate. Thank you. 
but sort of what I was talking about before, this second warrant had a little bit more of targeting the responses, I would say, where they say specifically, but I think it would probably be better to do that with like their card name or something, like when their X evidence tells you Y, right? Just to make it a little bit more clear. Um, I thought like overall, like this rebuttal wasn't that great. I think where it excelled was probably um, towards the end, I sort of like brought that narrative back. So like, I think like three out of the four responses sort of included evidence from our case, which then like makes the judge think a lot more time, like spend a lot more time thinking about our case. But I would say that the way I did that probably actually wasn't that good, right? Because now all they have to do is say, let's group their first, second and fourth response on our case, I'm just going to deal with that on their case, right? And now they've spent, they've spent so little time where I just spent like two minutes, right? So like off the bat, in this rebuttal, I'm giving them a positive time trade-off. And because of that, we're behind going into like the summary speeches and the final vote of speeches. So you want to not only be crossifying your evidence, but you want to be having like very direct refutations. And then at the end, you can be like, and that's why our evidence from case shows you this, right? But you shouldn't be using that as the sole refutation, just as the conclusion of like something that's already been independently logically warranted. Also, I think it was like a critical mistake that I didn't do any weighing in this debate really, um, or at least any like clear weighing. And I think that's again, because I spent so much time on these observations, but now they're going to be able to set up whatever weighing they want. And we're going to have to be able to respond to that or we're going to have to respond to that. And really our only like saving grace with that was the observation at the top of our case. But again, that's not very comparative, right? So you wanna be doing comparative weighing in first rebuttal so that they're always gonna be one step behind in the weighing debate, having to both respond to your weighing and then giving their own. Yeah. The observations that he put on our case, and then I'm going down a few things from rebuttal. And then obviously I will talk about their case as well. Okay, if everyone's ready. They start with a couple of observations. The first thing is that they try to indict every single study they read without calling for any of our evidence. We cite like Mathematica and Princeton. We know which pro charter school organizations look like. We're not citing them either. They have to actually call for cards in order to prove any of that's true. But then on the skimming argument, according to the Rand Corporation, in a nationwide study, char char charter school students are already lower achieving than district school counterparts. You can't look at national averages on this. You have to do the comparative between charter schools and district schools close by. And when you do that comparative, charter school students are actually lower performing initially. But then on zero tolerance policies, we would say this is a non-issue. They're going down in the status quo, according to the council and or according to the Christian Science Monitor. Most schools that were using zero tolerance policies recognize that they're not a good thing and their use is no longer widespread. Their second observation is just a cross application of their case. I'll talk about that later. But then he says that the quality of the school system is primarily about emotions and that only 14% actually comes from the classroom. Sasha and I contend the emotional development of students occurs in the classroom. So if we can prove to you that students have a better classroom environment, we're impacting that other 86% as well. But on innovation, you can group all of their responses. They're all about the fact that innovation doesn't happen. But we call for their card and it looks at testing data, which first of all goes against their case in the first place from 2005 to 2006. Not only does all of our evidence post date that, but we would say that the charter boot Boom happened after 2015 significantly in the last couple of years, according to the Washington or the Wall Street Journal, which means that the innovation that we are talking about is still happening. But then on outcomes, they basically cross apply their case. But one really important thing they talk about is how Corona and the recession, you're going to see more school cuts. We would say that the innovation that we're talking about doesn't actually cost money. It costs reallocations. According to the Washington Post, district schools have wasted $800 billion in the last 20 years. There is enough administrative waste to go around. But then they also give you the, the response that the waste that is cut is not things like bloat that we talk about, but of course is an analytic because the card doesn't exist. They never respond to Cords, who tells you that empirically when a charter school moves in near a district, you see 7% increases in student expenditures, which can decrease dropouts by as much as three clowns. That was clean dropped. But let's look at their case. On, on face, it's predicated on the assumption that it is charter schools that created the neoliberalist environment of our public school system. We would say that that's not true, as long as there have been things like private schools that create competition. The issue is that now we have a competition that is available for low-income public school students, and that is a good thing. But now let's go down their specific contentions. First, a marketization. 
couple of responses. First, DeAngelis tells you that, again, you're just reallocating spending. This is our entire case. But if you don't believe that, we would just say that throwing money at the problem isn't going to make it better. The, or, the, char the Before charter schools, education in the United States was failing. But since we saw a boom in charter schools, we saw graduation rates increase to an all-time high of 83%. They have a couple of impacts. The first is teachers. We would say that, first of all, teachers' unions really make it hard for widespread teacher cuts across the board. But I'm going to talk more about teachers a little bit later. But then they talk about educational deserts. We would say that education deserts are only bad if there's no schools for these students to move to. According to Camp of NYU and highly concentrated urban areas where charter schools are usually located, students are able to move to charter schools, which is why he concludes that actually graduation rates are increased when school closures happen. But now let's look to commodification. Their timeline on this is all wrong. They say that bad education happened and then charter schools were the reform and then charter schools caused standardization. But actually, according to Schrager, standardization has been around since the early 1900s when we created our public education system to turn out cogs in the machine of factories in the United States. After Sputnik in the, 19, in the 1960s, for example, we also saw increased standardization because we were competing with Russia. None of this happened because of charter schools, but we would say that charter schools came onto the scene to catch the students who slipped through the cracks of the public education system. Empirically, charter schools have decreased the amount of testing overall. For example, according to the Washington Post, standardized testing in the last five years has decreased, which directly disproves their argument. But really quickly on teachers, Charter schools also break away from this system. According to Amos, they hire fewer certified teachers, which allows them to hire 50% more diverse teachers, which can increase graduation rates of black students by as much as 13%. Thank you so much. Okay, so let's talk about our case where we tell you it was the introduction of standardized tests, or sorry, the introduction of charter schools that created market competition which then was like evaluated through standardized testing. You tell me that standardization has been around since the 1900s mm -hmm. or that it was normalized then, but I called for your evidence and it was talking about in Prussia, not about the US. Okay, well, we would say that regardless, the system that in the United States existed during, for example, industrialization was the same. The foundation of our public education system was to churn out workers to be, as you say, cogs in machine. Maybe that was- But really quickly, even if you don't want to believe our evidence on the early 1900s, which is fine. We also give you what happened during the 60s, which when we thought we were losing the space race and losing the Cold War, the government responded by increasing standardization okay. and starting to institute standardized testing in the so, United States. So can I ask you a question on your case? If that's yeah. Okay? Can we get back to this after that? Sure. So that was honestly probably a mistake. Um, you know, the whole like, can we get back to this later though? Because um, she sort of like, obviously with just those like two questions with rhetoric like it's fine if you don't want to believe our evidence she probably looks more legit than i do so far in this cross-examination and there are a lot of responses i can make to that argument to sort of clear it up very quickly in the judge's mind but because i don't do it then and there the narrative on my case has now become pretty muddled right so when something is fresh in the judge's mind or when you're talking about your case or your narrative, just the things that are going to win you the round, you always want to get the last word on whatever argument that is. So if you're going for a turn and they ask a question, make sure you get the last word. If it's your case, get the last word. Because at this point now, she has an air of perceptual dominance. And my narrative, which is like sort of what I'm hoping is going to win this round, is pretty muddled. How do you get your uh, like your words in without interrupting or sounding rude in that debate round? Yeah, so that was that was probably a big reason why this happened in this round particularly, because a lot of people uh, told me before I went into this round that the judges are going to care a lot about, you know, how polite you are, if you're cordial with your opponents, stuff like that. So I was like almost like pretty much hyper aware of how I was acting um, and, you know, how polite I was being. And for that reason, I didn't push any harder. But that might have like contributed to me losing the round, right? So I think being persistent doesn't necessarily have to conflict with being, uh, you know, polite, right? So you can say like, oh, think like, um, like yes, I understand your argument. I'm sorry for taking so much time, but really quick, if I could just say this, yeah, and then like you know, say whatever and be like, and you can have the next question, right? Sorry, we spent so much time on that. Like you can you can apologize for being persistent, but when it's something so important in the round then I think that's like a sacrifice that you have to make, right? Even if it's going to lose you half a speaker point in the judge's mind. Um, and I think you can also make up for that by being extremely polite in every other facet of cross-examination. That's not what has to do with you winning the round. 
you know, if it's like a piece of defense that you're probably not going to be going for, then by all means, just say like, okay, that's fine. Like we can talk about that in round, you know, but if it's something like this, especially in this round where it's all about the narrative and the logical backing, then it's going to be pretty detrimental if you let them, uh, you know, sort of just have whatever, like have their way with the arguments, I guess. Okay. So do charter schools have to abide by the same regulations and requirements as district schools? Um, not necessarily, but if they fail to meet a very like strict academic standard, then they can sure. be closed. Down. So how are those academic standards measured at charter schools? A lot of the time it's through like test scores. But a lot of the time it's through things like graduation rates too, right? Um, not really. The, I, I think, I think it's the sun bomb evidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The sun bomb evidence tells you that they have to meet strict academic standards and that as a result of that, it's sure. created an over testing. So in the industry. United States, holistically speaking, what is the trend to how we evaluate schools? Where is that trend headed? Um, we would say even if the, even in the past five years, if we've seen like a gradual decrease in standardized testing, like, it doesn't matter. Well, that's not actually what actually. I was going to say. I was okay. going to say that according to Kandinsky, a lot of states, like, for example, our home state of Ohio, are reevaluating the way by which they evaluate how schools are performing. And instead of focusing on teacher yeah. performance so, on things so like test if, scores, they're focusing on things like graduation yeah, yeah. rates. And as you say in your case, student satisfaction. Okay, that's fine. Even if those schools are doing it, though, the Simon evidence explains that like prospective parents evaluate market competition based on test scores, which then creates the industry. Okay, but so if you we were get back, parent, wait, really quickly, if you wait, were really, parent, We only have 40 seconds left. Yeah, now, can ahead. we get back to my critical thinking thing? Yeah. So you tell me that like in times of war or like mass innovation or arms races, we've seen these like uh standardized testing within classrooms right but insofar so, as the not necessarily i don't think you can necessarily interpret that to be times of war that was a very specific situation when the space race explicitly focused yeah us exactly on so when we so, so you when can't we need, extrapolate that to all times of right war. so like sure so like when we need mass innovation but mm -hmm. in times when we don't need these mass innovations like is there still this over testing yeah, probably. I would say that we're at a time right now when there's no huge like war necessarily looming. I mean, there are obviously conflicts happening, but we still see a decrease in test. Like we would say that well, testing. Like, yeah, the, but the that's point, like after yeah, the point that Sasha and I are trying to make. Let's not get too down in the weeds. Is that testing has been around for sixty years, a long time before church. Well, only during the times of like mass innovation, but yeah, let's stand across. Mm -hmm a weighing overview and then it's going to be dealing with our case, extending the observations on their case and then dealing with their case. Is everyone ready? Okay, sounds good. Start off with a weighing overview. We always outweigh on scope because they impact students who are only in charter schools, which is only 2 million kids in the population. Our impacts say that charter schools have fundamentally re-engineered the schooling terrain permanently affecting the pedagogies of all 50 million kids across the United States. Then though, we're also the prerequisite because of the JRF evidence they, that David raised there shows clean conceded, which says that the quality of the school you go to as a, as a function of choice only accounts for 14% of your educational outcomes. At that point, you functionally can't solve the root cause of educational barriers without fostering citizens that can critique the status quo and not reinforce structural inequality. This is always going to outweigh because on their side, they make it impossible to, to dismantle neoliberal structures in the future as students are trained from right when they enter school to not think critically, but rather to maximize their market value through test scores. On the top of our case on private schools, they basically say, well, first of all, this means that their second warrant doesn't matter because in that case, charters would already be incentivized to innovate. It's not a specific function of charter schools. But secondly, or public schools, but the second thing is that we're not talking about the same market. It's lower income students who can't go to private schools. So the specific competition was to cater to the vast majority of the population, which would either go to a public school or a charter school. On funding though, first I'd like to know, she says she's going to respond to teachers, but she doesn't, so that office is pretty cleanly extended and 173,000 person funding shortage because of the reallocation of funds, which goes away. That Berkeley evidence was not responded to about how now like priorities of school governments or of, of district governments are in a different direction, meaning that you're not getting funding for teachers. But more importantly, on deserts, all they say is that deserts aren't bad if students can go to other regions. That means that they cleanly concede Blakely about low income areas where there aren't other schools. That's Detroit. That's Philadelphia, they clean conceded 234 schools in Detroit closing down because two students didn't have another option, leaving hundreds of thousands out of school. The weighing is really simple because 50 million kids are in public schools, only 2 million are in private school, are in charter schools, and it's disproportionately in, um, disproportionately affecting low-income students. On standardized testing, the Schrager card that they read about how this is non-unique is about Prussia, and all it says is that education was standardized. It says nothing about testing itself. Compare this to the nuance of our evidence, which comes from Solomon, which says that schools used to do political 
technical skills, but because of the introduction of market competition, now they're not. Their Washington Post evidence just talked about the ACT and the SAT. To be very clear, that's not our impact. Our impact is about the focus of people in schools. They're only teaching to the test because the Simon evidence tells you that, that how successful charter schools and public schools are is hinged on their standardized test results. So it makes a lot of sense they would only be focusing on that. Then they say that they're hiring more diverse teachers. This is fundamentally unresponsive because we are talking about teachers' incentives once they're in schools, not the people who are teaching in the first place. You know, they're just, if anything, reinforcing what Mulder says is the status quo of structural inequality because people aren't critiquing it. On their case, they basically drop on competition the turn about how competition decreases because whenever there are comp competitive market entities, they're not sharing any innovation and it's duplicative at the very best. But on district schools, they give you no evidence that public schools are currently doing bad, just that they're extremely bloated. We would say the trade-off is away from good curriculum. If anything, you're just seeing more emphasis on standardized tests in district schools. They also misunderstand the point about COVID, which is that money has already been cut, meaning that administrative budgets would have already been cut, meaning that in public schools, you're going to seek literal closures because they can't take away from administration. They're going to take away from the existence of the school itself, for which, very, for which reason we're very proud to negate. is that we went for the entirety of our case, right? And that took a lot of time. So instead of saying, we're going specifically for our sub point B about commodifying outcomes, very clearly explaining the logical warranting of that, and then responding to their refutations, we went for everything in our case. And then as a result, the entirety of the case was very blippy, even though the responses to their refutations were good and probably true. And the extensions of reputations on their case were also good and true um, because we went for everything. We sort of were just very blippy and we didn't get the message across to the judges. It made a lot of confusion for both everybody debating and the judges. And then as a result, it made it a lot harder for us to vote or a lot harder for them to vote for us. Is anyone not ready? <laughs> The argument is that is winning this round today is the idea that we're improving district schools, which on the whole helps to break the systematic oppression that they talk about in their case. They have three ways in which you could weigh this round. All of them don't make a lot of sense. The first is on scope. They say we're only impacting up to charter schools. That's not true. When you have a charter school in the area, empirically, it improves not only the graduation rates, but the outcome later in life of those students located in district schools near it. That's really good. But they also say they prerequisite our case because quality schools only offer 14% of emotional development. We would say, first off, consider Considering that students spend the majority of their day within school, we would say, yes, schools play a large part in the emotional development. We would also say having a good school means you're probably going to be better off emotionally on that. We are winning this round. But let's talk about our arguments. They try to read one turn by saying innovation decrease. First of all, our argument is not innovation, it's specialization. But also, they don't quantify how much this happens. Cords tells you that even if you want to believe their evidence on that, spending on district schools increases by 7% when you have competition existing. That's really good because remember the competition we're talking about is not bad competition it's good competition that incentivizes the quality of education across the board to get better but then they also say because of coronavirus we're seeing budgets being cut first off they don't quantify how much budgets are being cut but we would also say considering the public education system has wasted 800 billion dollars and according to Forrester they tell you when you cut money from the system they're not cutting bad things like programs they're cutting administrative bloat that helps them become more effective and more and educate more students in the long run that's really important because they don't actually respond to that argument. Remember, DeAngelis tells you we cut bloat in administration, which Courts tells you says results in a 7% increase in spending on public schools, which results in light increase by 40% likelihood that students aren't held back, which means they're less likely to drop out, which means on the whole, we improve the quality of education for students in the United States, both in charter schools and out. But let's talk about their case. There's a few things that don't make sense. They first say private schools is a contradiction that competition is happening. We're saying competition is already happening, but the difference here is charter schools is a good type of competition that we didn't have before. They have a few things they go for. The first is this argument on teachers. They say we didn't respond to it. But first off, we did. Maggie said that unions make it very hard for wages to be cut in the first place. That's why we're not seeing the mass amounts of teacher loss that they talk about. But second, you can turn it and group it with their other teacher argument where we tell you on the whole, the actual 
construction of charter schools means that black teachers or teachers uh, who are minorities are 50% more likely to instruct students, which means higher graduation rates and more achievement in what they are talking about. But they collapse on this idea of testing. They have their timeline wrong. Even if you don't want to buy the evidence that we give you, remember Spuxnet, which happened way before the charter school boom, incentivizes the standardization of our education system. That's important because as a response, we implemented charter schools. They ignore, they say the ACT scores doesn't matter, but it's indicative of a trend that we're moving away from test scores. The reason as to why is because charter schools have more flexibility in their curriculum and are incentivizing district schools through competition to move away from that and look towards other methods, such as graduation rates or increased wages, because at the end of the day, charter schools came after testing and are improving the educational system in the United States, not only for students within the schools, but also in district schools and on net that's better for the quality of education. Cool. Um, I don't think either of us have any prep time left, so we're ready for cross when you guys are. All right. As the first speaking team, do you mind if we take the first question? No, go right ahead. Let's start off on this idea of standardized testing. You say that starting like with Spuxnet, with, with, with like Sputnik, sorry, um, we call like an increased standardization of education. Standardizing education is different from increasing an emphasis on testing. Standardizing just means so, a full you know? so, Yeah, yeah. So uh, we understand what you're saying. Yeah. We would say that the standardized testing is a symptom of a standardized education, right? Because the metric by which you measure a standardized education and the quality of a standardized education is through standardized tests. I think that's like a fairly unfounded assumption because so, the evidence we read you in case is quite specific when it says the only need to like measure between competitive entities is when there is competition between charters and publics that's simon which says the outcome of the competition so, is on test scores so at the very so least that were the case very much okay. charter scores. sure if that were the case then why are we seeing standardized testing decrease right now in states starting to move away from implementing standardized tests as a way of measuring success we gave you responses in both rebuttal and summary. I can go over some of them. The first of which is that oftentimes your evidence is referring to the SAT and the ACT. That's okay. different. It's charter schools that have to regularly Wait, evaluate their students. Really fast. Really fast. We read two cards to you. If it's okay. If I may. I'm, I apologize. Really That's quickly. Okay. On the ACT SAT card, those are two of the biggest standardized tests in the United States. If colleges, some of the most elite colleges, are now saying you don't need a standardized test to get into right. our but school, that's moving away. And we also give you can we also give you can clarify on the first point. You, sure, go ahead. Before you go to the next one, yeah, sure, go ahead. That, like colleges incentives are different from stand, like from charter schools incentives the, a, the sat sure. and the apt serve a different function sure. for the charter school standardized testing but, so we would say no that relationship between abolishing the sat okay. and, the APT and abolishing no. standardized testing sure okay that fine we disagree with that because we think that schools prepare students for college but even if you don't want to buy that we cite to you Kandinsky, who tells you that a lot of schools, like for example, our home state of Ohio, are no longer using standardized testing to evaluate the performance of their schools or right. their teachers. And that's the general that's trend across the U.S. He was in rebuttal, but even if it was, that's if like we, okay. yes. we talked about it in cross. Yeah. But be like we have we have competing evidence. So again, I ask right. you to look at the logic, which is like in a market, you have to be able to compare the. Here's where sure. and we would say that the if we're, if, yeah. So if we're looking at what's logically happening. We would say that everyone knows that, as you say yourself, like students slip through the cracks when you have a standardized education system. That's why we contend that there was a boom in charter schools in 2015. We would say that there is a widespread social movement more towards what you are talking about, which is critical thinking. Like, look at us debating here right now. I think we can both say that we've learned more probably from debate than we have from school. That goes to show that like there is an emphasis on things like critical thinking in the United States right now. But that's time on cross is very clear which is that literally i right now i opened up a text edit document and just went like okay i'm going to one by one respond to every single thing that they just put on our case right and so you'll see in my final focus i go very step by step and respond to everything that they put down but in final focus that's probably not the best strategy because i don't have enough time for anything on their case pretty much and then everything is very under explained so which is probably why we ended up losing the round at this point and also that's been the trend throughout the round but i think in final focus you need to clear up the things that are going to make you lose the round 
Um, but otherwise, we want to be making everything just make a lot of sense in the judge's mind instead of going line by line. And for some reason, I had this very weird notion in my mind that if I just went, one, the first thing they say is this, two, the second thing they say is this, and so on and so forth, that I would win the round. And that's just uh, not at all how it plays out. Is everybody ready? Time. One second. <laughs> okay. Time begins now. The easiest place for you to vote for us is on our subpoint B about commodification of outcomes. They functionally misunderstand our argument. We tell you it was the introduction of charter schools that made a market competition of the education system. And the Simon and Rial evidence says that as a result, neoliberal leaders passed reforms that mandated standardized testing to evaluate that market for prospective parents. Without charters, this wouldn't have happened as there wouldn't have been any market to evaluate. As a result of this, students have lost the ability to critically think as the ethical and political learning that has, has been replaced with teaching to the test, which the Mulder evidence says allows for the perpetuation of structural inequalities as members of society can no longer actively participate in democracy. If you grant us this argument, we're winning the round. That's because of the weighing that Liana gives you, which has never adequately been responded to, which is from, comes from JRF, which tells you that because there are so many extraneous factors in determining quality of education, like if your parents are together, access to resources, the actual school you go to only determines 14% of your educational outcomes. All they say is that schools have a major part in like emotional development. We're not talking about emotional development. It's the access to tutors. It's like your parents are together etc. And the only way that you can solve all of those structural systemic issues that cause the education gap right now and cause bad education is if you produce citizens who can think critically. At that point, in their best case scenario, they're solving 14%. We're solving 100%. So they have a few responses to this contention. Firstly, they say that private schools have the same competition, but they don't respond to Liana's frontline. That this is not competition because there are two different markets, one being for the hyper-wealthy and one being for the middle class. Secondly, they talk about Stuxnet increasing standardization. But one, a lot of their evidence is literally talking about Prussia, not the United States, but two, this typically only happens in times when great innovation is needed, but the Saltman evidence, which is more isolated timeline, says that it is uniquely the introduction of neoliberal policies in the 90s that made education trend away from critical thinking and like critiquing the status quo and towards standardized testing. Lastly, they talk about this ACT evidence saying that testing is going down, but one, the ACT is only one test. If you burn down a forest and then plant a few trees, you don't get credit, but secondly, our argument is not about ACT, it's about mandatory evaluatory tests. On their case, or sorry, uh, on segregation, or on segregation, yeah, they never respond to what we tell you, which is that there's a mass exodus of teachers because of standardized testing. It doesn't matter if there's a few more black teachers if they all leave right after. Because we solve for the root problem and they never respond to the wane, we are very, very happy to negate. Thank you. Okay, um, I am going to start on our competition argument, and then I will move to their competition argument. Okay, is everyone ready? Great. What we say in our case makes a lot of sense. DeAngelis tells you that when there's no charter school present, district schools have a monopoly, which leads to things like $800 billion worth of bloat over the course of the last 30 years. Charter schools put pressure on administrations to spend money where it counts, which is why empirically, in the most important part of the round that has gone clean dropped by them, Courts find that when a charter school moves into an area, you see an increase in instructional spending by 7%. Why is that important? It's important because it leads to a decrease in retention by 40%, which can de decrease dropout rates by as much as three times. That's the scope right there. Not only are charter school students being better, the students in district schools are being better as well. But also we would say, that when you look to the effects of charter schools holistically, you see things like better graduation rates, better income long term, according to Baker. That means that we're not measuring by standardized test scores anymore. Across the board, you're seeing better outcomes. But let's look to their argument. They say that charter schools are bad because they created the standardization and this neoliberal fixation of our education system. We would say that that's not true. You can ignore the Prussia example if you want to. But remember, we were standardizing all the way back when Sputnik happened in order to compete with the Russians. They can see 
that we weren't testing, but we would say that testing is a symptom of the standardization of our education system that has been happening since the mid 60s. They called for that card and never responded to it. Even if they cite Simon that says the charter schools came around in the 90s, we're saying that doesn't matter because standardization happened before. In fact, we say that it makes a lot more sense that charter schools were a response to standardization. In final focus, they dropped all of their responses to specialization, where we tell you that because they don't have to abide by the same rules as district schools, charter schools can cater their programs to their specific students. That means that when they talk about that 14% number, you're helping students in the classroom to be better emotionally, but also you're solving long term for the kind of injustices that they're talking about, because only charter schools provide an innovative approach to teaching that breaks away from the standardization of our education system. Across the board, charter schools didn't cause standardization, but they are the net that catches the students that slip through the cracks of our standardized system. Thank you.